Hey guys, it's Abby and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we are going to be discussing the Lust Killer slash Shoe Fetish Slayer known as Jerry Brudos. So yeah, this is quite a crazy case. It's going to be really quite disturbing and it's going to be quite graphic as well. I am going to go into detail of all of his murders. So if you can't handle that, then I would strongly advise not to watch this video. But first, I'm going to start with a little history and set the scene for Jerry Brudos and his horrific murders. So if you do enjoy watching this video, then please make sure to leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and as always, I do like to chat with you guys, so make sure you put a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know what you think of the case. I'm sure most people would have heard a lot about Jer Jerry Brudos, especially if you have seen Mindhunters. I know that they do go and interview him on one of the episodes, but I'm yet to actually watch that. But yeah, he is quite well known and his murders are quite horrific to say the least. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to get straight into it because this is going to be a long case. I have a lot of information. So I just wanted to quickly explain what a lust killer or murderer was for those people who don't actually know. So it's basically a subcategory of the hedonistic killer and means that they are thrill seekers and that they gain pleasure from the torture and murder of their victims. And a lot of times it is the only way that they can actually get pleasure is from torturing and often mutilating victims. Okay, so Jerome Henry Brudos, known as Jerry, was born on January 31st, 1939 in Webster, South Dakota. He was the youngest son of Henry and Eileen Brudos, and he had an older brother named Larry. Like many of these lust killers, Jerry did not have a great childhood, and yet his upbringing was not exactly ideal. Jerry was an accidental birth, and his parents very much wanted a girl for their second child, so needless to say they were extremely disappointed with another boy. Not only were they a little disappointed that he wasn't a girl but they kind of put the blame on him and made him feel very much unwanted and yet yeah, didn't treat him very nicely at all. So from a young age, Jerry's family moved around a lot. His dad was never really around. I couldn't find out much information about him, but I believe he was working a couple of different jobs at the time. And so it was kind of just his mother and Jerry and Larry that were at home together most of the time. And his mother was very physically and emotionally abusive towards both Jerry and Larry. Because work was quite slim, they did move around a lot, which I think was mainly because of their father. Um, and they spent a lot of time in Oregon, California, and South Dakota. At age five, Jerry became fascinated with women's high-heeled shoes. At the time, he was living with his family in Portland, Oregon, and he was wandering and playing nearby the house when he came across a junkyard. So he started to play and look around in the junkyard and he found a pair of high heels. So little five-year-old Jerry puts the shoes on and wears them home and when he walks in the house and his mother sees him wearing women's high-heeled shoes, she basically flips her lid, scolds him repeatedly, rips the shoes off him and then eventually burns them. Some might say it's a little bit of an overreaction to a little kid who's just trying on shoes, but that is the that gives you an idea of how his mother kind of berated him throughout his childhood and throughout his life. So in 1945, the Brudos family moved to Riverton, California, and Jerry is six years old at this time and in the first grade. His teacher is wearing high-heeled shoes and she brings a second pair to class with her and just keeps them in the classroom. Jerry obviously takes a lot of notice of these shoes and he decides to hide them so that he can take them home with him later. However, a classmate sees him trying to take the shoes and 
He basically dobs on Jerry to the teacher. The teacher yells at Jerry in front of the entire classroom and Jerry is humiliated and leaves the room. At the ages of seven to eight, Jerry fails second grade. During this time, he was diagnosed with measles, sore throats, swollen glands, and laryngitis. He had to get several operations on his extremities to fight off fungal infections. He also complained about frequent headaches that often left him unable to see clearly, and the school thought that maybe this was why he was failing and not doing so well at school, so they referred him to get glasses to try and help alleviate his problems. However, after doing an examination, the eye doctor didn't find a need for Jerry to get glasses, so instead he gave him a thin prescription which was similar to a drug placebo. It didn't help much though and Jerry's headaches persisted. Between the ages of 8 to 12, Jerry's family moved twice, first to Grants Pass, Oregon and then to Wallace Pond, Oregon. Also, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing any of these names right. So at Grants Pass, where they lived for a little while, the Brudos family had neighbors who had teenage girls. Jerry began sneaking into the neighbor's house with the girl's brother and playing with their clothes. At this time, his shoe fetish expands to women's undergarments, and so not only does he start stealing shoes, but also women's bras and underwear as well. As Jerry hit puberty, his mother showed a lot of disgust for anything sexual in nature, and one time she even forced Jerry to wash his stained sheets by hand. Around 16 years old, Jerry begins to have bizarre fantasies. One of these recurring fantasies involved him kidnapping a girl, forcing her to obey his commands, and then having her beg for mercy. His family moves once again to Corvallis, Oregon, and this is where Jerry's violent fantasies become reality. Jerry steals the underwear of an 18-year-old girl and then decides that he wants to get a nude photograph of her as well. So he set up an elaborate plot to get the girl to pose for a nude photo. He asked the girl to come over to his house so that he could help her get her underwear back. But when she arrived, she was approached by a masked man dressed in black who forced her to remove her clothes while holding a knife to her and then proceeded to take photos of her naked. Some reports also indicate that the girl was physically assaulted, but it's not very clear as to whether or not this was the case. The man then left her in the house and the girl got dressed and then fled. But as she was leaving the house, she ran into Jerry, who said that he had seen the intruder, but he had been locked in the barn. The girl left straight away and informed the police what had happened to her. At age 17, Jerry lured a 17-year-old girl to his car drove her to a deserted farmhouse and then beat her profusely. A couple driving by stopped on the scene of the crime and contacted police immediately. Jerry claimed that he had stopped to help the girl himself and that he was not the attacker, but neither the police or the couple believed him and eventually the Oregon State Police obtained a confession. In a search of Jerry's car and house, they found women's undergarments, photographs and photo equipment, and Jerry was arrested for assault and battery. He was admitted to a psychiatric hospital and spent a total of nine months there. His initial diagnosis was adjustment reaction of adolescence with sexual deviance and fetishism. Whilst being hospitalized, Jerry was still allowed to attend school and he went to North Salem High School in Dallas, Oregon. He is diagnosed as borderline schizophrenic but is discharged from the psychiatric hospital after the nine months and deemed not a danger to society. He graduated high school in 1957 and went on to study advanced technology at university but his attendance was erratic and eventually he gave up on school. He then decided to join the US Army at age 20 and was stationed at Fort Ord, California. However, he only spent approximately one year in the army before being discharged due to his bizarre behavior and obsessions. After being discharged, he moved back to Corvallis to live with his parents, but he was forced to live in the shed. One night, while out running an errand, Jerry saw a young girl walking around and decided to follow her home. He strangled her until she was unconscious, stole her shoes, took them back home with him, and then slept with them. 
Jerry picked up work at a local radio station where he met his future wife, 17-year-old Darcy Metzler. The two hit it off right away and began dating, to which Jerry's parents didn't approve. However, Darcy gave Jerry a kind of attention that he had not experienced in his life, being that his parents didn't show him any love or affection while he was growing up, and so the two were married within just a few months in the year 1962. From what I could find, they had a seemingly pleasant marriage at first. They both got on really well and they were basically perfect for each other. But eventually the marriage did start to crumble. One thing I did find was that Jerry would force Darcy to do housework completely naked wearing only a pair of high heels and he would take pictures of her which I'm not sure if, if it was something that she was okay with or something that like he was forcing her to do and she felt like she didn't have a choice. But she also confessed that Jerry would on numerous occasions wear women's underwear around the house, which she thought was really strange. And eventually this led them to become distant and he moved downstairs to the basement. However, apart from the fact that Jerry's a little bit weird, I don't know much about Darcy. I couldn't find a lot of information about her but they did seem to have like a pretty normal life and at this time, at least for those few years in his early 20s, Jerry was reasonably normal. At age 23, Jerry becomes a father to his first child, a daughter named Megan. The family move around a lot due to Jerry not being able to maintain employment and he's between jobs at this time. Finally, the couple settle in Portland and Jerry picks up a job as an electrician. Not long after, Darcy falls pregnant again and when the couple find out that they are having a boy, they are thrilled. However, for reasons that are still a little bit unclear, Darcy does not allow Jerry to be present during the birth of their son, Jason. I think that it might have been just due to the fact that they'd been fighting and they were quite distant and maybe they weren't in love anymore, I'm not 100% sure, but for whatever reason this really upset Jerry and it kind of set him off again. He began having his constant migraines again and also suffered from blackouts which seemed to compel him to act on his violent fantasies. Shortly after Jason was born, Jerry stalked a woman in Portland, following her home, breaking into her house and attempting to steal her shoes. The woman woke up and Jerry choked her until she became limp, raped her, stole her shoes and then fled. She was left unconscious but did not die and Jerry was not connected to this crime until much later. In January 1968, Jerry Brudos committed his first murder. Linda Slauson was just 19 years old at the time of her death. She was selling encyclopedias from door to door in her neighborhood, Portland, Oregon. When she knocked on Jerry's door, he managed to convince her to come down to his workshop, which was in the lower garage of his house. There, he hit her with a 2x4 before strangling her to death. Before disposing of her body, Jerry kept it for some time, undressing her and then redressing her with the stolen undergarments from his collection. He then cut off her foot, placed it in a high heel which he kept in his downstairs freezer and then dumped her body in the Willamette River. Just 11 months later, in November 1968, 23-year-old university student Jan Susan Whitney was driving home from a Thanksgiving feast when her car broke down, leaving her stranded on the side of the road. Jerry happened to be driving down that road and saw the girl pulling over to offer his assistance. He ended up strangling her in her car before having sex with her body. Then he brought her body back to his workshop, redressed it, took photographs and then cut off one of her breasts to keep as a trophy. Her car was later found abandoned at a rest stop on Interstate 5 between Salem and Albany while her body was found nine months later tied to a piece of railroad iron. His next victim would be 19-year-old university student Karen Spinker in March 1969. He abducted her from the parking lot of a downtown business, brought her back to his home, raped her, strangled her to death, and then had sexual intercourse with her body. He then removed both of her breasts and kept them as molds in his freezer. 
Jerry had actually been seen by two young girls on the rooftop car park and they had informed police that a large male dressed in drag was there on the same day that Karen had gone missing, right where they had found her car abandoned. At this point, Jerry's crimes were accelerating in that the cooling off period between each abduction and murder was becoming shorter and shorter. Not having been caught for any of the murders or abductions that he had already committed, Jerry was becoming filled with dangerous self-confidence. Within a month of killing Karen Spinker, Jerry attempted to abduct three girls within just a few days. Jerry attempted to kidnap 24-year-old Sharon Wood at gunpoint on April 21st, followed by 15-year-old Gloria Jean Smith on April 22nd, and then 14-year-old Leanne Brumley on the same day as Gloria, who he attempted to shove into his car when she escaped. These girls had also been physically assaulted by Brudos during the attempted abductions. On April 23rd, 22-year-old Linda Dawn Saley is abducted from a shopping mall car park. Jerry posed as a police officer, stuffed her into his car, took her back to his workshop where he strangled her and then fornicated with her corpse. He then decided not to cut off her breasts because they were, quote, too pink. After he was done, he tied her body to a car transmission with a nylon cord in order to keep it weighed down and then threw her body into the Willamette River. Linda's body is discovered a couple of days later by a local fisherman and just a day after that, Karen Spinker's body is also found just a mere 50 feet away. Her body was tied to an old engine which kept it submerged underwater. Police began to realize that they could be dealing with a serial killer and they started working out his patterns in order to stalk areas where women were present. During the course of their investigation, police discover that a strange man had been calling dorm rooms at Oregon State University claiming to be a Vietnam veteran and asking for a date. One of the students agreed to go out with him and she later described him to police as a heavy set man with light hair and freckles. During the date, he actually brought up in conversation to this girl about the bodies of the two women who had been discovered in the Willamette River. When the police spoke to her a few days later, they asked the young woman to give him a call and arrange a second date. He agreed to meet up with her again and when he arrived, police were waiting on scene to arrest him as a possible suspect in the murders. After another young woman whom he had attempted to abduct earlier identified him in a lineup, police were able to obtain a search warrant for his house. They found a ton of evidence linking him to the crimes, including trophies that he had kept from some of his victims, nylon rope that he had used in killing some of the victims, and photographs. At first, Jerry tried to plead not guilty due to insanity, but his plea was revoked after he underwent testing by multiple psychiatrists, which showed that he had an above average IQ and cognition and therefore was not criminally insane. With evidence building up against him, he eventually pled guilty to three of the murders, Saley, Sprinker and Whitney, but was never tried for Slauson's murder as a body was never recovered and no photographs of her were ever found. He had also discarded her foot after it had become rotten in the Willamette River. Jerry received three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. I'm not sure why he wasn't also charged with the attempted abductions and assaults of the other victims who came forward, whether or not they just didn't get enough evidence to take it to trial I'm not really sure but for some reason those charges were not put against him he was only charged for the three murders but I suppose he did still get three life sentences but he was transferred to the Oregon State Penitentiary where he would spend the rest of his life he tried to appeal his convictions three times but each one of them were unsuccessful. Interestingly, his wife Darcy was suspected to be an accomplice in his crimes because she was apparently brainwashed by Jerry Brudos. She was not even allowed access to his workshop, which Brudos had set up like an intercom system, so she had to actually ask for permission before she was able to go in. So Darcy was actually tried as an accomplice to one of Brudos's crimes, 
but she eventually was let off because she pled not guilty and they couldn't find any evidence to actually connect her to the crimes. She always denied knowing anything about the killings and after Jerry was incarcerated, she divorced him, changed her name and moved herself and her kids to an unknown location. She also obtained a court order forbidding her children to ever write or visit their father in prison. I honestly do wonder if she did have anything to do with it or if she at least knew something because how do you not know that your husband is bringing home girls to your house and torturing them inside your house like while you are there? Like how did she not see or hear them? Not to mention that he has a locked room in the downstairs area of your house that you do not have access to that he spends most of his time in. Is that not a little bit suspicious? I don't know, it just seems a bit fishy to me but then again there are so many serial killers out there who had wives and children who had no idea that they had ever committed a crime. So Jerry Brudos died of natural causes at age 67 while he was in prison in March on March 28, 2006. At the time, he was the longest incarcerated inmate in the history of the Oregon Department of Corrections. In total, 12 women went missing in Brudos's era, but only seven were connected to him. But yeah, that is the case of Jerry Brudos, the lust killer. Definitely a very interesting case. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!